Welcome to Tremophonic Audio Stories. Tremophonic, The Sounds of Fear, is a collection of original horror stories presented in audio format. Today's story, The Slinger, The Sailor and The Spy, was written as a project of passion and is free to listen to. Please visit tremophonic.com, follow our Tremophonic social media and podcast accounts, and share our posts and stories to a wider audience. You can find us on Patreon and buymeacoffee.com if you want to support the development of future stories. This is The Slinger, The Sailor and The Spy. Half cocked, his revolver at his side, palm cupped and ready to draw. His fingers twitched, itching to lift the barrel to face its foe. But John is no quick draw, and this was, indeed, what led him to this predicament, opposite a poultry farmer two minutes before the dawn. The previous day, John and his brother George had been caught by the farmer rustling chickens from the coop. When confronted, George had drawn his revolver and fired in such a panic that three shots hit the farmer's barn door. This had given the farmer time to empty both barrels of his shotgun into George's chest before turning to face John. In all that time, John had simply managed to unclip his holster, his face white with shock. The farmer turned his shotgun in hand and landed a heavy blow with the butt of his stock over John's head. A blow that rendered him unconscious. John came to in the local jail, and after a brief interaction with law enforcement, a desire for swift justice led the farmer to suggest a duel at dawn as a solution. But John knew one thing, his opposition did not. It's logical that a duel at dawn should not be advantaged by the position of the sun. So the combatants this day were made to align north to south along the main street in town. However, this was John's territory. He was all too aware of the town's quirks and secrets, John knew where the rain would cause puddles to form, which shop signs the wind would rattle noisily, where shadows fall in the street marking the high noon. But most importantly, at this moment, he knew which windows reflect the morning sunrise along the street. So he waited, patiently with trigger finger poised and ready for a solar flash of reflective glory to blind his opponent and save his soul. As the sun finally showed its face, the spark of reflected light was met with a spark of gunpowder as John's hammer fell to strike the barrel. John smirked at his outwitted enemy, but so too destiny smirk at John. Ever so slightly misaligned, his revolver's bullet struck the inside of the cylinder, exploding the weapon in his hand. As misfortune would have it, the hammer shattered with the backward force propelling it upward through John's skull, rupturing his eye and embedding it inside his frontal lobe. John fell to his knees as blood poured from his face. His brain injury was, in fact, not fatal. But the blood vessel severed under his chin as his jawbone had fractured was causing a slow and prolonged exsanguination. John fell forward, face down in the dirt, struggling for his last breath in a pool of blood and dust. The swirling blood filling his eyes flowed around 
a dusty outline of a cloaked figure. When your time is up, the Reaper will collect. Ian awoke below deck, pitch black except for sun rays needling through gaps between the ship's rotting rafters. Waves beat relentlessly against the flimsy timber hull. From where he lay, he could see faint but sleeping shadows along the galley to the armory. Without pause, Ian stumbled out of his back-breaking berth to ready himself for what he knew might be a struggle, grabbing his belt with his loaded flintlock musket attached. For this ship was no longer his ship. Until the previous day, Ian had been first mate aboard this illicit vessel, but an insurgence by the ramshackle crew had overwhelmed the captain and his faithful few. Ian had been ashore at the time, gathering supplies, but had returned to discover new leadership. Feigning his support of these actions, he had waited for his opportunity. And now it had come. He quietly crept between the bunks, bare foot past snoring sailors. A lone lantern lit the armoury ahead, but that one flame was all he needed. Prying back the loosened top of a barrel, he scooped handfuls of gunpowder, scattering it around the floor and against the ship's hull. This final act of sabotage would be his late captain's retribution, an act in honour from beyond the grave. Ian grabbed the single, flickering lantern, turned and threw it down into the gritted gunpowder at the back of the room. As spark-singed wood and embers ignited all around, Ian turned and ran, but in his hasty stumble through the darkness, he failed to notice a protruding rusted nail from the barrel lid lying face up pointing skyward. The full weight of Ian's body landed his foot onto that nail, and he let out an almighty cry. Around him, crewmates woke to fire and screams and a clear act of sabotage. Ian's hands were blackened with gunpowder and the discarded lantern rolled against the damning barrel lid, now attached to his foot. Two crewmates grabbed their muskets as Ian fumbled for his own. He realised his fate was set. Imminent explosion of the barrel, burning ship, or lead fired from the muskets. It wasn't a pleasant set of choices. So in a final gesture of stubbornness, he held his musket at his waist. His shot would be inaccurate, but raising his arm would invite his crewmates to shoot first. As he pulled the trigger, the spark of the hammer landing on the gunpowder ignited the remnant black powder in his hand. Ian felt the burning in his hand as flames immediately engulfed his entire arm. The smell, sound and sensation of searing flesh overwhelmed his senses. The desperate scream he released preceded his sudden, explosive demise by mere seconds. As the yellow and red flames filled his vision, a faint outline of a cloaked figure remained. When your time is up, the Reaper will collect. As the passengers took their seats, the crew secured the aircraft doors. 
The familiar, calming tone of the captain's voice came over the speakers, but Sean's attention was elsewhere. Two rows in front of him sat a man with a briefcase. This man, in a pink shirt and a pork pie hat, had been the focus of Sean's attention since Geneva, when he had picked up the briefcase from its previous handler. Sean, as was usually the situation, knew the case was his target, but he did not know why. He also knew that its handlers would protect it at all costs. Currently, as was necessary, the case was in the overhead locker, and the pink-shirted man held his hat in his lap, revealing a shining hairless head, perfectly distinct to see across the top of the seats. The aircraft taxied out to the runway. Sean continued to watch the locker. As the plane left the ground and the safety information routine was delivered, Sean continued to watch the locker. The refreshment trolley came and Sean was still so fixated on the locker, he neglected to notice the air steward pour half a glass of wine onto the floor next to him. A stewardess hurried over to mop up the mess, but as she did, she firmly pushed a freshly folded towel into Sean's chest, staring him sternly in the eyes. This broke Sean's concentration, as he inquisitively squinted back at her before he felt the press of something solid against his chest, even through the soft flannel of the towel. With a sudden moment of clarity, he grasped the towel, realising the accomplice he had been informed would present him with an opportunity had now made themselves known. Just a peek inside the folded fabric confirmed his suspicion. A small calibre handgun, low-powered enough that it shouldn't cause a problem in an aircraft. Sean clutched the towel tightly as his unfaltering gaze on the overhead compartment continued, waiting for an opportunity to present itself. The bald-headed man in the pink shirt stood up and stepped into the aisle. Reaching up to the locker, he carefully pulled the briefcase down. But instead of returning to his seat, he awkwardly shuffled towards the toilet cubicle, slid back the folding door, and sidled inside, the door latch audibly locking behind him. As Sean raised himself out of his seat, he nodded to his newly allied stewardess. Very casually, she ambled over towards the cubicle door, pulling a key from her pocket. Without losing her stride, she passed her hand over the locking mechanism, releasing the lock and extinguishing the occupied signal. Sean carefully carried the towel, his hand concealed inside, and sped over to the door. In one fluid motion, he retracted the door and forced the gun through the gap so that the pink-shirted man would have no time to react. But react he did. Sean felt his hand lift sharply as he glimpsed the briefcase's black facade under his arm. With his remaining free hand, he reached through in an attempt to grasp the briefcase, hoping the handle would be facing upwards. As he fumbled for the curve of leather, he was sure should be there. A pink-sleeved arm came down on his gun. In that instant, Sean's tightened grip drew back the trigger and a round exploded out of the firearm. In the tight confines of the cubicle, it ricocheted off two mirrored walls, then pinged off the metal plated floor panel before speeding through the open door and up into Sean's armpit. Sean immediately collapsed backwards, releasing his grip on the weapon as he stumbled and slumped against the wall opposite. Looking back along the plane, he could see multiple panicked faces 
staring back at him from all angles. Light-headed, Sean looked down to realise his vein had been pierced. He was losing blood faster than it could possibly be replenished. As the faces faded to darkness and the voices to a murmur, one image remained. That of a tall, cloaked figure. When your time is up, the Reaper will collect. The Slinger, the Sailor, and the Spy, Masters of the Sun, Sea, and Sky. Not just a John Doe, any Tom, Dick, or Harry. Every soul is eventually mine to carry. Thank you for listening to The Slinger, The Sailor, and The Spy, presented by Tremophonic. The Slinger, The Sailor, and The Spy was written, performed, recorded, and edited by Richard Wilson, with music and sound effects from Alexander Nakarada at Serpent Sound Studios, Feslian Studios, Pixabay, and Mixkit.com. Don't forget to follow Tremophonic on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Tremophonic.com, and keep an eye on podcast channels for our upcoming stories. As a self-funded project, we would appreciate any support you might be willing to give us on patreon.com forward slash tremophonic or buymeacoffee.com forward slash tremophonic. Thank you for listening.